Come Sunday, we drove around to the house where Ma was living with the two boys, and we helped her out to the buckboard. Ma was all slicked out in her Sunday go to meeting clothes, which meant she was dressed in black and all set to see her new home for the first time. Orrin, he sat in the seat alongside her to drive, and Bob and Joe both mounted up on Indian ponies they bought up they brought up the rear. Cap and me, we let off. Cap didn't say much, but I think he had a deep feeling about what we were doing. He knew how much Orrin and me had planned for this day and how hard we had worked. Behind that rasping voice and cold way of his, I think there was a lot of sentiment in Cap, although a body would never know it. It was a mighty exciting thing at that, and we were glad the time of year was right, for the trees were green, and the meadows green, and the cattle feeding there, well, it looked mighty fine. And it was a good deal better house than Ma had ever lived in before. We started down the valley, and we were all dressed for the occasion, each of us in black broadcloth, even Cap. Ollie was going to be there, and a couple of other friends, for we'd sort of figured to make it a housewarming. The only shadow on the day was the fact that Tom Sunday wasn't there, and we wished he was. All of us. Tom had been one of us so long, and if Orrin and me were going to amount to something, part of the credit had to be Tom's, because he took time to teach us things, especially me. When we drove up through the trees, after dipping through the river, we came into our own yard, and right away we saw there were folks all around. There must have been 50 people. And the first person I saw was Don Lewis, and beside him, Drusilla, looking more Irish today than Spanish. My eyes met her, hers across the heads of the crowd, and for an instant there, we were together like we had never been, and I longed to ride to her and claim her for my own. Juan Torres was there, and Pete Romero, and Miguel. Miguel was looking a little pale around the gills yet, but he was on his feet and looked great. There was a meal all spread out, and music started up, and folks started dancing, the fandango, or whatever they called it, and Ma just sat there and cried. Orrin, he put his arm around her, and we drove all the rest of the way into the yard that way. And Don Lewis stepped up and offered Ma his hand. And Mr., it did us proud to see her take his hand and step down. You'd have never thought. You would have thought she was the grandest lady ever not just a mountain woman from the hills back in nowhere. Don Lewis escorted her to a chair like, like she was a queen. And the chair was her own rocker. And then Don Lewis spread a, 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 a serape across her knees. And Ma was home. It was quite a shinding. There was a grand meal with a whole steer barbecued and three or four javelinas, plenty of roasting ears and all a man could want. There was a little wine, but no drinking liquor. That was because Ma and because we wanted it to be nice for her. Vincent Romero himself, he was there. And a couple of times I saw Chico Cruz in the crowd. Everybody was having themselves a time when a horse splashed to the creek, and Tom Sunday rode into the yard. He sat his horse looking around, and then Orrin saw him, and Orrin walked over. Glad you could make it, Tom. And it wouldn't have been right without you. Get down and step up to the table. But first, come and speak to Ma. She's been asking for you. That was all. No words. No explanations. Orrin was that way, though. He was a big man in more ways than one. And he liked Tom, and he wanted him there. We had a fiddle going for the dancing, and, and Torin, o Orin took his old guitar and sang up some songs, and Juan Tor sang, and, and we had us a time. 
and I danced with Drew. When I went up to her and asked her to dance, she looked right into my eyes and accepted. And then for a minute or two, we danced together and we didn't say much until pausing for a bit. When I looked at her and said, I could dance like this forever with you. She looked at me and said her eye and said her eyes sparkling a little. I think you'd get very hungry. Ollie was there and he talked to Don Lewis and he talked to Taurus and he got Taurus and Jim Carpenter together and got them both with Al Brooks and they talked it over and Taurus and the Mexicans would support Oren and right there and then Oren got the appointment. Oren, he walked over to me and we shook hands. We did it, Tyrell. We did it. Ma got herself a home and the boys will have a better chance out here. Without guns, I hope. Orrin looked at me. I hope so, too. Times are changing, Tyrell. The evening passed, and folks packed into their rigs and got back into the saddle, and everybody went home, and Ma went inside and saw her house. We'd bought things, the sort of things Ma would like, and some we'd heard her speak of. An old grandfather's clock, a real dresser, some fine tables and chairs, in a big old four-poster bed. The house only had three rooms, but there would be more. And we boys had slept out so much, we weren't fit for a house anyway. I walked to her carriage with Drew, and we stood there by the wheel. I've been happy today, I told her. You brought your mother home, she said. It's a good thing. My grandfather admires you very much. He says you're a thoughtful son and a good man. Watching Drew drive away in that carriage, it made me think of money again. It's a high card in a man's hand when he goes counting if he has money. And I had none of that. True, the place we had belonged to Orrin and me, but there was more to it than that. Land wasn't of much value these days, not even cattle and cash money was awfully scarce. Orrin was going to be busy, so the money question was my chore. Orrin, he worked hard stuttering, studying Blackstone. From somewhere he got a book by Monta Montague, and he read, he read Plutarch's Lives, and he subscribed to a couple of Eastern papers, and he read all the political news he could find. And he rode around and he talked to folks or listened to them tell about their troubles. Orrin was a good listener who was always ready to give a man a hand whenever he was down. That was after. That was after the first big night when Orrin showed folks who was Marshal of Mora. That was the night he took over. The night he laid down the law. And believe you me, when Orrin takes a hold... He takes a hold. At sundown, Orrin came up the street wearing the badge, and the settlement men were around, taking their time to look him over. Having a marshal was a new thing in town, and the settlement outfit, it was a good joke. They just wanted to see him move around so they could decide where to lay hold of him. The first thing Orrin done was walk through the saloon to the back door, and on the inside of the back door, he tacked up a notice. Now that notice was in plain sight, and what was printed there was in both Spanish and English. No gun shall be drawn or fired within the town limits. No brawling, fighting, or boisterous conduct will be tolerated. Drunks will be thrown in jail. Repeat offenders will be asked to leave town. No citizen will be molested in any way. Racing horses or riding steers in the street is prohibited. Every resident or visitor will be expected to show visible means of support on demand. 
That last rule was pointed right at the riff staff, which hung around the streets, molesting citizens, picking fights, and making a nuisance of themselves. They were a bad lot. Bully Ben Barker had been a keelboat man on the Missouri and the Platte, and he was a noted brawler. He was several inches taller than Oren, and he weighed 240 pounds. And Bully Ben decided to find out what the new, new marshal was made of. Bully Ben wasted no time. He walked over to the notice, read it aloud, and then ripped it from the door. Oren got to his feet. Ben reached around, grinning cheerfully, and took a bottle from the bar, gripping it by the neck. Orn ignored him and picked up the notice and replaced it on the door. And then he turned around and hit Ben Barker in the belly. When Aaron Orn had gone by him and replaced the notice, Bully Ben had waited to see what would happen. He had lowered his bottle, for he was a man accustomed to lots of rough talk before fighting. And Orn's punch caught him off guard right in the pit of the stomach, and he gasped for breath and his knees buckling. Coolly, Orrin hit him a chopping blow to the chin that dropped Ben to his knees. The unexpected attack was the sort of thing Ben himself had often done, but he was not expecting it from Orrin. Ben came up with a lunge, swinging his bottle, and I could have, I could have told him he was a fool. Blocking the descending blow with his left forearm, Orrin chopped that left fist down to Ben's jaw. Deliberately, then, he grabbed the bigger man and threw him with a rolling hip lock. Ben landed heavily, and Orrin stood back, waiting for him to get up. All this time, Orrin had acted mighty casual, like he wasn't much interested. He was just giving Bully Ben a whooping without half trying. Ben was mighty shook up, and he was astonished, too. The blood was dripping from a cut on his jawbone, and he was stunned. But he started to get up. Orrin let him get up, and when Ben threw a punch, Orrin grabbed his wrist and threw him over his shoulder with a flying mare. This time, Baker got up more slowly, for he was a heavy man, and he had hit hard. Orrin waited until he was halfway to his feet, and then promptly knocked him down. Ben, ben sat on the floor, staring up at Orrin. You're a fighter, he said. You pack a wallop in those fists. The average man in those years knew little of fist fighting. Men in those days, except such types as Bully Ben, never thought of fighting with anything other than a gun. Ben had won his fights because he was a big man, powerful, and he had acquired a rough skill on the riverboats. But Pa had taught us. He taught us well. He was skilled at Cornish-style wrestling, and he learned fist fighting from a bare-knuckles boxer he'd met in his travels. Ben was a mighty confused man. His strength was turned against him, and everything he did, Oren had an answer for. And on a cooler night, Oren would never have worked up a sweat. You had enough? Oren asked. Not yet, Ben said, and got up. Now that was a mighty foolish thing, a sadly foolish thing, because until now, Orn had been teaching him. Now Orn quit fooling, and Ben Barker straightened up. Orn hit him in the face with both fists before Ben could get set. Baker made an effort to rush and hold him with his left. Orn smashed three wicked blows to his belly, then pushed Ben off, and broke his nose with an overhand right. Ben backed up and sat down, and Orrin grabbed him by the hair, and picking him up off the floor, proceeded to smash three or four blows into his face. And then Orrin picked Ben up, shoved him against the bar, and said, Give him a drink. He tossed a coin on the bar and walked out. It looked to me like Orrin was in charge. After that, there was less trouble a man, than a man would expect. Drunks, Orrin threw in jail, and in the morning, he turned them out. Orrin was quick, quiet, and he wasted no time talking. And by the end of the week, he had jailed 
two men for firing guns in the town limits, and each had been fined $25 and costs. Both had been among the crowd at the Pawnee Rock, and Orrin told them to get out of town or go to work. Bob and me rode down to Rudicio and Cap Roundtree and picked up a herd of cattle I'd bought for the ranch, nigh onto a hundred head. Holly Shattuck hired a, a girl to work in his store, and he devoted much of his time to talking about Orrin. He went down to Santa Fe, over to Cimarron and Elizabethtown, always on business, but each time he managed to say a few words here and there about Orrin, and each time mentioned him for the legislature. After a month of being Marshal and Mora, there had been no killings, only one knifing, and the settlement crowd had mostly moved over to Elizabethtown or to Las Vegas. Folks were talking about Orrin all the way down to Sirocco and Silver City. On the grant there, there had been another killing. The cousin of Martin Albros had been shot from the back. Two of the Mexican hands had quit to go back to Mexico. Chico Cruz had killed a man in Las Vegas, one of the settlement crowd. Jonathan Pritz came up to Mora with his daughters, and he bought a house there. It was two weeks after our housewarming before I got a chance to see, to go see Drew. And she was at the door to meet me and, and took me in to see her grandfather. And he looked mighty frail, lying there in bed. It's good to see you, Tyrell, he said, almost whispering. How was your ranch? He listened while I told him about it and nodded his head thoughtfully. We had 3,000 acres of graves and it was well watered, a small ranch by most accounts. It's not enough, he said. To own property in these days, one must be strong enough to keep it. If one is not strong, then there's no hope. You'll be on your feet again in no time, I said. He smiled at me. And from the way he smiled, he knew I was trying to make him feel good. The fact was, right at that time, I wouldn't have bet that he'd lived out the month. Jonathan Pritz, he told me, he was demanding a new survey of the grant, claiming that the boundaries of the grant were much smaller than the land that Don had claimed. It was a new way of getting him and a troublesome one, for those old grants were bounded by this peak or that ridge or another peak. And the way they were written up, a man could just pick his own ridges and his own peaks. And if Pritz could get his own surveyor appointed, no, they would survey Don Lewis right out of his ranch, his home, and everything. There's going to be serious trouble, he said at last. I, I, I shall send Drusilla to Mexico to visit until it's over. Something to seem go right out of me then. If she went to Mexico, she would never come back because the Don was not going to win this fight. Jonathan Prince had no qualms and he would stop at nothing. I sat there with my hat in my hand, wishing I could say something. But what did I have to offer a girl like Drusilla? I was night of broke. Right then I was wondering what we could do for operating expenses. And it was no time to talk marriage to a girl, even if she would listen to me. When that girl was used to more than I could ever give her. At last... The Don reached for my hand, but his grip was feeble. Tyrell, you are like a son to me. We've seen too little of you, Drusilla and I, but I found much in you to respect and to love. I'm afraid, Tyrell, that I have not long, and I am the last of my family. Only Drusilla is left. If there's anything you can do to help her, take care of her. Don Luis, I'd like, I mean, I don't have any money. And Don Luis, right now I'm broke. I must get money to keep my ranch working. There are other things, my son. You have strength and you have youth. And those are needed now. If I had the strength. Drusilla and I sat together in the large room and the Indian woman served us. And looking down 
the table at her. My heart went out to her. I wanted Drew so bad. You know, what could I do? Always, there was something that stood between us. Don Lewis tells me you're going to Mexico. He wishes it, Ty. There's trouble here. What about Juan Torres? He's not the same. Something has happened to him, and I believe he's afraid now. Chico Cruz. I will miss you. I do not want to go, but when my grandfather tells me to do, I must do. I'm worried for him, but if I go, perhaps he will do what must be done. Any way I can help? No, she said it so quickly and sharply that I knew what she meant. What had to be done, we both knew. Chico Cruz must be disciplined, fired, and sent away. But Drew was not thinking of the necessities. She was thinking of me. And she was afraid for me. Chico Cruz. We knew each other, that one and I. We had a feeling about the other. If this had to be done, then I would do it myself. And there was no hope that the dawn would recover in time. For we both knew that when we parted tonight, we might not meet again. Don Lewis would not have enough strength, and his recovery would take weeks or even months. What was happening here, I understood. Taurus was afraid of Cruz, and the others knew it, so their obedience was half-hearted. There was no leader here, and it, and it was nothing Cruz had done or needed to do. I doubted if he had even thought of it. It was simply the evil in him and his willingness to kill. Whatever was to be done must be done now at once. So we ate and talked, and I was thinking it out. And this was nothing for Orrin Cap or, or anyone but me. And I must do it tonight. And I must do it before this went any further. Perhaps then she would stay, for I knew that if she ever left, I'd never see her again. At the door, I took her hand. It was the first time. I had found courage to do it. Drew, do not worry. I will come to see you again. Suddenly I said what I had been thinking. Drew, I love you. And then I walked swiftly away, heels clicking on the pavement as I crossed the court. But I did not go to my horse, but to the rooms of Juan Torres. It seemed strange that a man could change so in three years since we had met. Three years. <sighs> he had changed in months. And I knew that Cruz had done this, not by threats, not by warnings, just by the constant pressure of his being here. Juan? Tyrell? Come with me. We're going to fire Chico Cruz. He sat very still behind the table and looked at me. And then he got up, slowly. You think he will go? He looked at me, his eyes searching mine, and I told him what I felt. I, do not co I don't care whether he goes or stays. We walked together to the room of Antonio Baca. He was playing cards with Pete Romero and some others. We paused outside and I said, we'll start here, you tell him. One hesitated only a minute and then he stepped up into the room and I followed. Baca, you will saddle your horse and you will leave. Do not come back. Baca looked at him and then he looked at me and I said, you heard what Taurus said. You try it once, you try it once in the dark when my back was turned. If you try it now, you will not be so lucky. 
put his cards into a neat, compact pile. And for the first time, he seemed at a loss. Then he said, I'll talk to Chico. We will talk to Chico. You will go. Taking out my watch, I said, Taurus has told you, you have five minutes. We turned and went down the row of rooms and stopped before one, before one that was in, in the dark. Taurus struck a light and lit a lantern, and he held up the light to the window, and I stepped into the door. Chico Cruz had been sitting there in the darkness. Taurus said, We don't need you any longer, Chico. You can go now. He looked at Taurus from the dark, his steady eyes, and then he looked at me. There's trouble here, I said, and you do not make it easier. You are to make me go? His eyes studied me carefully. It will not be necessary. You will go. His left hand and his arm were on the table, toying with a forty-four cartridge. His right hand was in his lap. I said one day that we would meet. That's fool's talk. Juan has said you are through. There's no job for you here. And the quarters are needed. I like it here. You will like it elsewhere, Taurus spoke sharply. His courage was returning. You will go now, tonight. Cruz ignored him. His dark, steady eyes were on me. I think I shall kill you. That's fool's talk, I said casually, and swung my boot up in a swift, hard kick at the near edge of the table, and it flipped up, and he sprang back to avoid it and tripped, falling back to the floor. Before he could grasp a gun, I kicked his hand away and then grabbed him quickly by the shirt and jerked him up from the floor, taking his gun and dropping him in one swift movement. He knew I was a man who used a gun, and he expected that, but I did not want to shoot him. He clung to his wrist, and he stared at me, his eyes unblinking, like those of a rattler. I told you, Cruz. Taurus walked to the bank and began stuffing Chico's clothes into saddlebags and rolling his bedroll. Chico still clung to his wrist. If I go, they will attack the ranch, Cruz said. Is that what you want? It's not what we want, but we cannot risk you being here, Chico. There's an evil that comes with you. And not with you. He stared at me. Perhaps. Anyway, I shall not be here. We heard the sound of a horse outside and glanced out to see Pete Romero leading Chico's horse. And Chico walked to the door and he looked at me. What of my gun? He said and swung into the saddle. You may need it, I said, and I would not want you without it. So I handed him, I handed him the gun, nor did I take the shells from it. He opened the loading gate and flipped, the cinder, and flipped the cylinder curiously. And then he looked at me, and he held the gun in his palm, his face expressionless. For several seconds, we remained like that. And I don't know what he was thinking. He had reason to hate me, reason to kill me. But he held the gun in his hand, and he looked down at me and at my own gun, 
which remained in its holster. He turned his horse. I like you, he said. I think we will never meet. One horse and I stood there until we could hear the gallop of his horse no longer. 